Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Good Shepherd Episcopal Church here in Wailuku, Maui. My name is Moki Hino, and I am the priest in charge. And I'm Peter Lee, your senior warden. And I would like to just say thank you for being here and joining us for this service and just for your support in general throughout this year. We are marking the last Sunday in June and it's mid-year, so thank you again. This morning is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, proper eight. At, it is June 27th, 2021. We have considerable help with this morning's service. Uh, Ferdinand Kahigal and Carissa Kahigal are our music ministers. Matthew Yagen and Andrew Yagen our, are our acolytes. Uh, Peter Lee is our responder. And our readers are Isaiah Lampetak and Peter Lee. Our intercessor is Natasha Lau, and as always, we thank our technical team for making this service possible. And with that, we will begin our service with the ringing of the bell. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory, Glory to, to God, God in the highest and, highest, and peace to his people on earth. earth. Lord God, God heavenly, heavenly King, King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the sure foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 
Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now we will have the reading of the lessons. The first reading is a reading from the wisdom of Solomon. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things so that they might exist. The generative forces of the world are wholesome, and there is no destructive poison in them. And the dominion of Hades is not on earth, for righteousness is immortal. God created us for incorruption, and made us in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we will read Psalm 30, breaking at the asterisk. I will exalt you, O Lord, and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing to the Lord, you servants of his. Give thanks for the remembrance of his holiness. For his wrath endures but the twinkling of an eye, his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may spend the night, but joy may come in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor, made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with the Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sack clothing and clothed me with joy. Therefore, my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. As you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I'm giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something, now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that they should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that they may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to fall And all those lonely roads that I travel There was Jesus When the life I live 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her this, so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with Jairus, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She'd endured much under her many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? Jesus looked all around to see who'd done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before Jesus, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he'd entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child isn't dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him 
and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, we're blessed this morning in our gospel reading by two stories that are very, very rich, not only in images, but also drama, uh, showing you and me uh, one very important thing, that Jesus is the giver of life. Uh, we have the two readings, one within another. Uh, the first is Jesus is approached by Jairus, a uh, leader of the synagogue who's reaching out to him in desperation despite any previous kind of theological conflicts they may have had because he is desperate for his daughter to be healed uh, by Jesus. So Jesus goes toward the home of Jairus and then all of a sudden, boom, right in the middle of that we get the second story which is this poor lady who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Uh, she spent all her money on doctors. She's got no resources left and so like Jairus she's also desperate for uh, Jesus to to heal her. And she's of course heard about him and all she wanted to do was she didn't even want to talk to him you know she just wanted to go up and touch his cloak in secret uh, not, not wanting to call attention to herself at all. Why? Because she was unclean, uh, because she was hemorrhaging and she, she knew that. And so she goes and she touches the hem of Jesus, and just the hem now, not even his body. And um, he says, who touched me? You know, he, he uh, knew that something had happened and uh, that he was being touched by this woman in a way that was different from the rest of the crowd. Uh, the power uh, that was in Jesus went out of him in, in a way that was different. And um, it's not because the woman was afraid of Jesus. Uh, that, that's not the case. I mean, obviously, she was pretty persistent. Uh, but she was afraid because society at large uh, told her she had no business being there. Um, 2,000 years later, have things changed or are they the same? I ask you to uh, ponder that with me. Um, reminds me of the, the 1990s where um, so many people were afflicted with HIV AIDS and uh, even though they couldn't hurt anyone, uh, they, many of them kept their disease uh, secret and when their times came they said, um, many of their families said that they died of cancer or things like that. Jesus isn't angry uh, in this story. Um, I think we, we project our own stuff onto it sometimes and when we read it, you know, we, we make him say like, who touched me? You know, that's not what he was saying. <laughs> he was saying it more like, you know, out of curiosity, I wonder who touched me? What's going on here? Who, who is this uh, that's so different from the rest of the crowd? Um, and then he, of course, when he discovers who the woman is, he has compassion for her, that notion of suffering with. And he doesn't, he doesn't say to her, I'm the one who made you well. He says to her, your faith has made you well uh, because she was so persistent and she believed in him. Uh, then, so that's all done, 
and then it's time to go continue on to the house of Jairus. Poor Jesus, can you imagine? And he's got all these people clamoring around him and he's got a mission uh, to, to go and do something for Jairus' daughter and the crowd is getting in the way. Um, and then somebody tells Jairus that his daughter is dead and not to bother uh, Jesus anymore. All hope is gone. There's nothing they can do. And Jesus said, uh, like he says so many times in the Bible, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Imagine, you know, you've just lost your 12-year-old daughter and you hear, don't be afraid. How reassuring must that have been if Jairus really believed it? So um, then he takes his three disciples with him and he takes them because he wants to show the three disciples what will happen. He keeps the rest of the crowd out uh, because he doesn't want to sensationalize what's going to happen. He wants to show uh, his three disciples what is going to happen and he doesn't want to cause a big fuss about it, probably because the, the crowd won't get it. Um, they won't get what this is all about. You know, this isn't about calling attention to Jesus. Uh, this is about reaching out to uh, somebody with compassion and kindness. And so he says to the girl very gently, uh, Talitha kum. And we know from the story that she rises from the dead. Both stories are um, remarkable and they say something to us over 2,000 years later. Uh, and what they're saying to us is that Jesus is the source of healing and that Jesus is the source of life. Uh, even if we feel like we may be so sinful that we're spiritually dead, Jesus is still the source of healing and uh, still the source of our lives. And I think that he goes out to uh, this girl and he uh, reaches out to, not reaches out to, but uh, ministers to the hemorrhaging woman um, to show us that each and every one of us are meant for wholeness. And that's why we have this line in the book of Lamentations. Uh, it says, although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Uh, it's from Lamentations. It's talking about uh, the nature of, of God. Um, you know, we're meant to share life with Jesus forever. Uh, and I think many of us strive for that, but in spite of that, uh, we're constantly in need of God's healing uh, because, um, you know, we're fallen people and uh, we're not perfect. And uh, God is uh, calling us to have health in every aspect of our lives, not, not just our bodies, but every aspect of our lives, uh, which is really speaking to the nature of healing. Healing is not about cure. Um, healing is about wholeness and uh, integration into the presence of God, which is why I always tell people that integrity means so much more than honesty. Integrity means that we are fully integrated with the, the, the presence of God. And uh, it, uh, it bears thinking about uh, because how do we get that wholeness? And how do we um, get that full integration with God? And uh, I submit to you that a good way to do that is to be integrated with all of God's people. And the way that we do that is we share. Uh, we share from our abundance. Um, that's why uh, Paul, in the, in the readings today, he says, the one who had much did not have too much. The one that had much did not have too much. And the one who had little did not have too little. I, I think if we share, um, then that really uh, becomes, becomes true. And um, if you really want a good example of that, think of Jesus Christ himself, uh, naked, uh, hanging on that cross, and still 
pouring out love, um, being concerned for the two thieves who were beside him, uh, being concerned for his mother, and uh, even being concerned for his executors, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, he is still giving of himself from his abundance of love. And, uh, you know, we're called to treat others uh, in their hours of need, uh, because at some point we're going to rely on others to treat us in our times of need. And, and it bears thinking about, you know, what do we genuinely need in this life of ours? Uh, what can we keep for ourselves that we need? And what is God calling us to share from our surplus? Uh, if there's any spiritual homework that arises from the result of these two stories, uh, that's the homework, you know, to, to really think about what is enough for us and what do we do with our abundance. Uh, what was enough for Jesus, and um, what does he do from his abundance? He, he gives of himself, um, he gives of his, his power. Uh, and so, you know, there's uh, really um, a, a lot of thinking, um, especially in light of COVID, you know, why do I have to wear this mask? Well, I'm not wearing one now, but um, that's, a, that's a question that was often asked. And I was so struck uh, by Bishop Fitzpatrick's answer to that. He said, we don't wear the mask for ourselves. We wear it for our brothers and sisters who cannot get vaccinated for uh, whatever reasons, whether they've had transplants, uh, whether their immunity uh, systems have been compromised. Uh, we have wholeness of health in terms of the virus and we're called to uh, share that wholeness with others by wearing the mask, by getting vaccinated if we can. Uh, and, and offering that up to the God of our understanding, uh, offering ourselves and um, acknowledging that God gives so much back to us. So. Uh, as we continue moving on in this pandemic, uh, even though we have light at the end of the tunnel, um, let's remember the story of Jairus and his daughter. Let's remember the story of the hemorrhaging woman and how Jesus gave of himself to show us uh, how we are also called to give of ourselves.
Let us affirm our faith by reciting together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe, we believe in, one in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his, and his kingdom, kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now for the prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. Pray for our retired clergy, the Reverend Bill Alvinger and Mark Delo, the Reverend Carol Arney, the Reverend William and Ann Allenbach, the Reverend David Barr and Jerry Otten, the Reverend Deacon Honey Becker, the Reverend Mahi and William Bynes, Reverend Peter and Valerie Bessenbrook, the Reverend David and Martha Blanchett, the Reverend Edwin and Catherine Bonzi, the Reverend Thomas and Jean Buchiel. We also ask your prayers for Michael, our presiding bishop, Robert, our bishop, and Moki, our priest, for this gathering and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for Joseph, our president, David, our governor, and Mike, our mayor, for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially Cornelius Hill, Irenaeus, Peter and Paul, Polly Murray, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Moses the Black, Walter Rosenbush, Washington Gladden, and Jacob Reese. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, 
and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful, merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and, word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.